number 10, we have the Lesser Flamingos. Old Daño Lengai in Tanzania is one of the most active volcanoes in all of Africa. On its northern flank is Lake Natron, and it happens to be one of the world's most toxic bodies of water. So surely nothing lives here, right? <laughs> wrong -o. It's actually home to a magnificent wildlife spectacle. It's the breeding and gathering place for over 2 million lesser flamingos. The water in Lake Natron often rises to temperatures above 40 degrees Celsius and highly alkaline due to the sodium carbonate and other minerals that flow into the body of water from the surrounding hills. This can make the water burn skin and make this body of water not hospitable for plants, humans, and most animals except for the lesser flamingos. They have tough skin and scales on their legs that prevents burns and they have this crazy ability to drink water at its boiling point. They also can remove salt from the water using its navel cavity. With all that, the lesser flamingo has made this infernal place its forever home. They are also free of most predators and with next to no competition for food, the flamingos feed on tons of algae which is the main source of food that comes from the volcanic water. Man, these things sound intense and super tough, even though they are just little skinny pink birds. At number 9 we have the Galapagos Land Iguana. The most active and most pristine of the Galapagos volcanoes is Fernandia Island. It is home to some of the archipelago's most beautiful and endangered species. These include flightless cormorants, penguins, sea lions, and of course marine and land iguanas. The female land iguana have taken advantage of the thermal heat that comes off of the volcano. Every year, a small gang of these lizards, around 2,000, they even have club jackets, make their way from the coast at the top of La Cumbre and descend to the dangerous slopes to the crater floor. Once they reach the bottom, the females lay their eggs in the soft, warm ash, which is the natural, perfect temperature for incubation. The constant threat of eruptions and earthquakes make it difficult for just about any animal that lives on or around these volcanoes, except for the land iguana. The land iguana can actually sense volcanic activity and most of the time will hightail it out of there before things get too heated. We have the vampire ground finch. Food and water is extremely limited on the volcanic island of Wolf and the Galapagos, so the species that live there have to improvise. No, they don't put on cringy improv shows if that's what you're thinking, and also before anyone gets mad at me, I'm an improv guy, I'm allowed to make that joke. Anyway, they have to find other ways to survive with what they have. So what do these finches do? Well, if you haven't guessed it by the name, they basically turn into vampires. Their usual diet is nectar, cactus, pulp, the contents of bird eggs, but they also drink other animals' blood. Ain't that darling. These vampire birds will pierce the flesh with their sharp beak and then draw in the blood. Doing this means they can consume through the other dead animal any nutrients that they have been missing in the dry months. Due to this change in diet, vampire ground finches now have the longest and most pointed beak of all the ground finch subspecies. Their usual blood sucking prey is the booby seabird. These seabirds don't even fight back anymore because it's actually an effective cleaning method for them. Either that or they just swarm in incredible numbers and they just have to fall down and take it. Either way, this one is proof that that Fighters exist. <laughs> At number seven, we have the polychaete worm. This might just be the coolest colored creature I've ever seen, but these guys not only live in volcanic territories, they're also quite the dangerous predators. So I'ma just admire from afar. These worms were found 3,900 feet or 1,200 meters below the surface off the coast of northern New Zealand. It has jaws that project just like the alien in the movie Aliens, so hell to the na, to the na na na. But scientists found this creature during a three week expedition in 2012 throughout four deep sea regions in the volcano rich Kermadec Ridge. They were found in and around undersea vents where undersea volcanoes release hot water and gases. As well with tons of other small corals, fish, and tiny organisms, these scientists found an abundance of new and not well known species, such as the Mickey Mouse squid. Yeah, I, I don't see it, but it still looks pretty cool, I guess. But until that, not much is known about these creatures yet, so if we want to know more, we will have to venture into some pretty hot waters. At number six, we have the Lohai Shrimp. The National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration reports one of the volcanoes in the Pacific West spews water that's similar to the acidity of battery and stomach acid. And sure enough, small animals and life forms can still be found down there. Animals such as the Lohai Shrimp. Mmm, <laughs> shrimp. Volcanoes are actually rich environments because of plenty of bacteria, minerals, and obviously warmth. These tiny shrimp have even tinier claws that are like garden shears so they can graze on bacterial filaments. In the same expedition where scientists found the polychaete worm, there was also a shrimp found that could feed off of things killed by the noxious plumes leaking from the underwater volcanic vents. So next time you go to a restaurant and order the volcano shrimp, clarify what kind of shrimp it is. 
Coming in at number five at our halfway point today, we have the Aleutian Auklets. These incredibly interesting birds nest on lava fractured land because they're so metal, you know? <laughs> but they have a weird and fun little hang up with their nesting locations. The feces of the auklet will actually fertilize the lava crusted ground they nest on and soon will grow thick mats of grass. That's good, right? <laughs> Wrong. The auklet's survival depends on the land periodically being swept clean of lava. If the land grows too lush, then these birds actually lose their homes. In the Aleutians in the Bering Sea, 15 million of these tiny birds live in colonies that can reach 1 million swarming all over the rocks and circling above like rolling dark clouds. Imagine seeing that on top of a volcano. You would probably begin to think that the apocalypse was happening. In some areas, these bird populations are dwindling, and in other younger, more often locations with lava flow, they are flourishing. How about that? The destruction of lava is actually the saving grace for the Auckland, although these birds are not immune to volcanic eruptions. In 2008, when the Kasatochi volcano erupted during the Auckland's breeding season, tens of thousand Auckland chicks were caught in the destruction of the eruption and were entombed in hot ash. But the Auckland's came right back like nothing. Nothing even happened and appreciated the newly ashy landscape. At number four, we have Malios, the national bird of Sulawesi. The Malio is part of a group of birds known as megapodes, birds that lay their eggs in volcanoes. Back in 2013 in the Bronx Zoo, a pair of Malios hatched a couple of young chicks, which led to the media catching on to these strange nesting habits of these birds. These megapode birds are one of the oldest living groups of birds on the planet. Most of them are also turkey-like in appearance, so <laughs> happy Thanksgiving. Many birds incubate their eggs using their own body heat, but megapodes use the magical wonders of nature, and they bury them inside volcanic soil oils, sun warm beaches, or rotting vegetation. <laughs> eh, sounds great. <clears throat> However, these birds numbers are dwindling and that is why it is important to learn what we can from the few that we have in captivity. Once we study them and their living patterns a bit more, hopefully we'll be able to save them in their natural habitat as well. Starting us off in our top three, at number three we have the Eurotychus squat lobster. Remember that little expedition off the coast of New Zealand I was talking about? Well, one of the other animals they found down there around those acidic and heated volcanic vents was the Eurotychus squat lobster. These lobsters live at depths of 2,130 feet, which is 650 meters, and depths of 4,600 feet, which is 1,400 meters. The squat lobster of the Eurotychus isn't the first known species of its kind, but its species hasn't been formally recognized yet either. These lobsters are almost always found with and associated with deep sea coral. They can often be found attached to bamboo coral. Other than that, not much is known about these creatures because they live at such great depths near hot and acidic water, but maybe if we explored our oceans a bit more like I keep on saying, Dewey would have more to tell you. At number two, we have the lava lizards, another freaking cool metal name. Okay, maybe not metal, but still cool if you ask me. They have grayish greenish bodies with a bright red head, but these lizards can range in a variety of colors based on their location. They can range from gray to green to black to blue. The males tend to be brighter colored with yellow spots and gold stripes, and the females are usually the ones with the red throat or red head. <laughs> oh my god, I do love redheads. They also happen to live atop of hardened lava, hence the name Lava Lizard. The lava lizard is one of the most abundant reptiles throughout the Galapagos. I also just want to add that these male lizards also lift. They are known to perform a series of push-ups in order to intimidate other males looking to steal their territory. <laughs> this is really good, I can't even... This is hilarious. The push-ups make the male look larger and dissuades the other males from wanting to start a fight. If an intruder thinks he is bigger and stronger, then a push-up competition will ensue. Weird. I think that's exactly how it goes here in Toronto too. At least on King West, that is. Anyway, if things still aren't settled after the push-up contest, then these lizards will then start tail slaps or biting as their last resort. Still very King West if you ask me. If you don't know what that is, Google it. I guess King West and the Galapagos are just filled with a bunch of uh, hotheads. <laughs> Literally. And finally, in at our number one spot, we have freaking sharks with freaking laser beams attached to their freaking heads. Just kidding. But we do have Pacific sleeper sharks. During that same 2012 expedition, scientists from National Geographic were exploring the Cavici volcano underwater and came across two species hanging out inside the volcano's caldera. This captured everyone's attention because this is one of the most active volcanoes in the southwest Pacific. These sharks were also found just 12 miles from it, which didn't make sense at first because these waters should be too hot and acidic for them to survive. 
Their discovery down there raises more questions than answers, unfortunately. The Pacific sleeper shark is usually found in the North Pacific from Japan to Mexico. And if they are traveling and living in and around the Kavichi volcano, then this is the furthest south they have ever been. I don't know. Sounds like they might be uh, belonging to a secret supervillain who is dead set on taking over the world, if you ask me. There you have it. That has been our top 10 animals that live in volcanoes. Which was your favorite? Mine was without a doubt the super jack bro like lizards, because I mean, <laughs> come on, you can't make that stuff up. I want to start off strong, you know, real invigorating animal. Something you haven't heard of, and what better than whatever this is. Here is what we know about it. So, among all the carnivorous mammals that have ever lived, the Androsaurus might have been the largest. Uh, it eats meat, it lives in the Inner Mongolia region of China around 56 to 33.9 million years ago. Well, it's vaguely related to present day hippos and aquatic mammals such as whales and manatees. Yeah, I think that's about it. Honestly, we know next to nothing about the Androsaurus. A guy named Roy Chapman Andrews, who became the director of the American Museum of Natural History and was an explorer, found a foot and a skull belonging to this creature but nothing else, and no other fossils have ever come to light before or after, thus it's named after him as the finder. Still, based on related animals, the Androsaurus seemed to be about the size of a rhino and took down prey with massive jaws, acting more like an enormous wolf than a cat. Hopefully more found fossils will fill in what we know about these 45 million year old enigmas, but if we've only found a foot and a skull, the future's looking pretty dim for Andrew. At least he gets to live on in the video game Ark Survival Evolved. And hey, if you don't want your future looking dim like dinos, instead as bright as the asteroid that hit them, be sure to subscribe to The Hive for more of Bumblebee's regularly posted videos. This one makes me happy. I don't have to see the pictures, but you do. Number 9 is the Koala Lemur. Well crap guys, looks like we found Gonzo's genetic lineage, because what the hell is this thing? I literally hate every single photo I've seen of the Koala Lemurs, who are an extinct genus, thank god. Honestly, that belonged to the family of the Megalopedia. They once inhabited the island of Madagascar, but died out 500 years ago due to habitat fragmentation and deforestation. The koala lemur earned its nickname from the cranial and dental similarities to the Australian koala, which eats exclusively eucalyptus leaves. But since the two species are not closely related in the slightest, these anatomical similarities are likely a result of convergent evolution, perhaps adaptions for leaf eating diets. I don't know. Speaking of convergent evolution, ideally that's also the explanation as to why this whack job animal has high anatomical similarities to the snub nosed monkey, normal, and horses. These big B words to make a matter of its appearance somehow dramatically worse were literally the weight and sometimes the size of an adult person, averaging 5 foot 3 feet and approximately 187 pounds. Rest assured though, they were only one of the 17 giant lemur species on Madagascar. While there's still many lemur species on the island today, more than 100, the big boy ones died out between 500 and 2000 years ago. There's been a lot of fascinating news of these guys recently, so let's cover dire wolves for number 8. Their bones are commonly found in the La Bria tar pits of West Hollywood, but these bad boys like their feline counterparts, the saber toothed tiger, ran the show in North America long before the ice age or running full speed into a tar pit wiped them out. So this wolf species is about the same length as the modern grey wolf, but it weighed a little bit more, as much as 175 pounds. Think of how there are normal German Shepherds and they're already pretty big animals, but then there are King German Shepherds, which are like the cap lock version of the original dog. Both have strong jaws, but only one's is so strong it can sever a human arm from the body. So it's that, but a billion years ago, feral and bigger. Nonetheless, they went extinct about actually 10,000 years ago, and while their smaller cousins thankfully are still around, having made a comeback in recent years thanks to the reintroduction programs like Yellowstone National Parks, studies emerge just this week are revealing the recent findings that saber toothed cats and dire wolves appear to have suffered major bone and joint disease towards the end of their existence. A discovery that may indicate these creatures were forced to breed with their litter mates as they went extinct. For the dire wolf, 2.6% of their femurs and 4.5% of their shoulders had defects towards the end of their species. Nothing says relaxing evening at the park like number 7. Instead of feeding them some breadcrumbs, you're running away from them. Terror birds. 
after the dinosaurs died, someone had to fill in their big shoes, and from the dust and the darkness emerged the one animal that would tell all others, hold my beer. For much of the Cenozoic era, terror birds dominated South America and hunted for sport, running upwards of 60 miles per hour and using its face as a literal hatchet against other animals, until they went extinct themselves around 2 million years ago. Though numerous different breeds of the species have been discovered, the largest of this flightless bird stood at 10 feet tall and weighed more than 1,000 pounds. Its enormous skull, one of the largest known skull for terror birds, and as a matter of fact, the largest known bird skull, period, to quote, that said, some scientists have suggest terror birds were more bark than bite despite that. And they weren't predators at all, but rather herbivores. Don't feel peace at that though, like mentioned, it means when they did hunt, it was for sport, not food, and that's a different kind of crazy. Paleontologist Louis Schiap feeds the nightmare machine by casually mentioning an interview, I mean, we know that a little parrot, a cockatoo, can take your finger off, Schiap told The Wired, but imagine what a bird like that could have done, the damage it could have done with just a strike of this massive skull and beak. Yeehaw! Up next is the Syrian wild ass, number six. This little kick ass guy was one of the smallest equine there ever was, and I guess its tiny stature didn't allow room for any emotion that wasn't spite, because these guys refused to be domesticated. By the way, scientists like saying that they couldn't be, but that really means a species just wanted nothing to do with humans. So the Syrian wildie lived in the desert, semi deserts, dry grasslands, and mountain steppes. Native to West Asia, they were also found in Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Turkey, Syria, Saudi Arabia. And it acts. Its color changed with the seasons, turning a tawny olive color in the summer months and a pale sandy yellow in the winter. Between its beautiful coat and remarkable face, these animals were compared to a thoroughbred horse for aesthetic and strength. There's actually a lot of stories about them too. Xiophon of Athens mentions Syrian wildies in his Anabasis of 370 BCE. He reports that they were the most common of animals encountered in Syria and that horsemen would occasionally chase them for fun, since the wildies could easily outrun the horses. Xiophon then said it was almost like a game for them, as they would only run a short distance ahead of the horses before stopping, waiting for the horses to get closer, and then running ahead again. He also said that the little wildy guys were impossible to catch without careful planning first, and the meat tasted like a more tender version of venison. It's believed that they may be the wild ass that Ishmael was prophesied to be in Genesis in the Old Testament, and there are also references to the animal that appear in the Old Testament books of Job, Psalms, Jeremiah, and the Deuterocanonical book of Siraj. They even get a Quran shout out. European travelers in the middle Middle East during the 15th and 16th centuries reported seeing large herds, but tragically their numbers began to drop during the 18th and 19th centuries due to overhunting and then a regional upheaval of World War I. The last known wild specimen was fatally popped in 1927 in Jordan, and the last captive specimen died the same year in Vienna. Number 5, Giraffe Moose. Oh, what, you think I'm kidding? Bam, Giraffe Moose. Tell me if that is anything else. This Giraffe Moose, actually named the Zevotherium, is an extinct genus of giraffe that ranged throughout Africa to the Indian subcontinent. It was the largest giraffe known and also possibly the largest ruminant of all time. Remains have been recovered from the Himalayan foothills dating around 1 million BC, and scholars agree that species came to be around 7 million years ago in the late Miocene and was likely gone by the early Pliocene. But, um, oopsies. How did it go extinct a million years ago if there's evidence of its existence up until 8,000 years ago, dummies? Some of the earliest indications were found in an ancient rock paintings in the Sahara and the central West India. Then, when archaeologists were tearing up the ancient Sumerian city-state of Kish in 1920s, they find an elaborate copper rain ring created to fit onto the tongue of a chariot, and the artists had carefully recreated a unique animal down to the smallest details. And what can be seen is an awful like a Civitherium, which can be thoroughly reconstructed from fossil remains. Unlike giraffes of today, Civitheriums had short necks with short stocky legs, and at the time of their first discovery of the bones of the mammals in the 1800s, Researchers, I wish I was joking, thought it might be the link between giraffes and elephants, and now I have to get that image out of my brain. And what better to follow up the moose giraffe than number four, desert rat kangaroo. That one isn't even a lazy nickname I thought of. These novelist at heart scientists really named this thing with the cadence of a hillbilly. Well, it jumps like a kangaroo, looks like a rat, and it's in the desert. That's a mighty fine name we got there right as is. To make up for the lack of ingenuity, the indigenous of the outback had a pretty fun name for it, Ulakun. This small hopping marsupial from the desert regions of central Australia has a kind of crazy backstory. It was discovered in the early 1840s, and by discovered, I mean colonizers learned about it for the first time. The indigenous of the terrain had been using it as a food source for centuries, but then it vanishes for 90 years. The species was then rediscovered. 
discovered in 1931 by Hedley Finlayson, a one-eyed, one-handed chemist with a passion for Australian mammals. Imagine a little animal about the bulk of a rabbit, but built like a kangaroo, with a long, spindly hind leg, tiny forelegs folded tight on its chest, and a tail half as long, again as the body, but not much thicker than a lead pencil he had written. Now one of our only visual accounts, because that was the last one ever seen. There was a 2011 reported sighting of a desert rat kangaroo nest, but this yielded no usable DNA. Another animal I can't say, so I'm just gonna dub is the giant capybaras, coming in at number three. Josephio argiacea. I'm lucky if I managed that correctly. You'd also be able to be lucky to survive one of these things because they're literally giant killer hell rats. They complete opposite in every way to what we just covered in the last point. These inflated rodents resembled capybaras the size of cows, with an estimated average weight of one ton. And it's the largest rodent known to have lived, which was approximately four to two million years ago during the Pliocene to the early Pleiocene. Imagine a bunch of killer rats just roaming around, 10 feet long with another five feet of tail. They might have been herbivores, but their foot long incisors would have packed such a strong bite that I don't want to think about it. Some theories suggested that they used said teeth to fight over females for breeding rights, but other than that, they used them like shovels to find roots. The Pliocene era is around the same time that the last ice age ended. Changes in climactic conditions are believed to have contributed to the decline of the species, alongside competition from invasive species migrating from North America. For number two, we look at what I can only dub as cursed elephants. It's like a wizard came along, and since the elephants were talking crap about them, the wizard cursed them to have upside down mouths. Why are your tusks there, bro? Seriously. Today's elephants obviously have uh, less eyesore tusks, ones that come straight out of their jaws since they're supposed to be teeth, but their ugly cousin ancient relatives did not have the same arrangement, evidently. Around 20 million years ago, there lived a prehistoric creature named the Deotherium. It was, its name was accurately derived from the ancient Greek word for terrible beast, and the large prehistoric elephant survived until the early Pleistocene. Uh, precisely what the elephant used its bizarre tusks for isn't clear to scientists. One out of pocket throwaway idea is that the Deotherium used to use them to anchor itself to riverbanks while sleeping so its body could just float in deep water. Amazingly, isolated populations of Deotherium persisted into historical times until they either succumbed to changing climate conditions or were hunted into extinction by early Homo sapiens. Not any of our distant relatives like Neanderthals. They were hunted by us. That means these awful looking things existed at the same time as modern humans. Imagine seeing one of those at night, half asleep while trying to pee in a bush. Stuff of nightmares. Anyways, always the last but never the least, it's number one, the Tasmanian tiger, aka the thylacine. Can't tell if it's a cat or a dog just by looking at it, but they're pretty cute. As you can see, they're about the size of a coyote and they have a magnificent wide long snout, helping them be apex predators. In fact, they were the only marsupial apex predator that lived in modern times, and therefore they played a massive key role in the ecosystem. Naturally, that doesn't bode well with humans. European settlers of the 1800s get all mad and blame the TT for the death of their livestock. In reality, records of farm animal deaths in those times show that the culprits are feral dogs and human habitat mismanagement. You'd think if you invaded someone else's land and chose to live there, completely inept at cultivating it, you don't get to complain about the ecosystem around you. But instead, the Euro settlers hunted the Tasmanian tigers to the point of extinction. Eventually, all that remained were in zoos, and the last of the tigers named Benjamin died from negligent exposure in 1936 at the Bumera Zoo in Tasmania. Negligent exposure. This happened directly after the animal was granted protection status. Benjamin is also the only Tasmanian caught on film, as you can see in this colorized version. So, interesting news times. Two layers to it. The first is that the TT could still persist in the most remote parts of the island. In July of 2019, Australian authorities received a report of a footprint spotted by an unnamed individual on a walk up the Sleeping Beauty Mountain. The man, to quote, wasn't able to take a photo. However, when he got home, he Googled it and believes it was the Tasmanian Tigers. That same year, more credibly, a government plant biologist saw what they believed to be a Tasmanian Tiger 100 feet away from him in a remote area. Meanwhile, in 2018, three cyclists insisted they witnessed a TT crossing the road in front of them. These are just three of more than 1,200 alleged sightings reported between 1910 and 2019. Layer number two, almost 100 years after its extinction, the Tasmanian tiger may live once again in a different way, a sketchy Jurassic Park kind of way. Scientists want to resurrect the carnivorous marsupial by harnessing advances in genetics, ancient DNA retrieval, and artificial reproduction. The initiative is taking place at their thylacine integrated genetic restoration research lab and is headed by Professor Andrew Pass, who says that this technology offers a chance to correct extinction and could be applied in experiments 
exceptional circumstances where cornerstone species have been lost. Starting us off at number 10, we have the fish made famous by Disney Pixar's Finding Nemo, the angler fish. In case you're wondering which exact fish from Finding Nemo I'm talking about, it's the one that scares the hell out of Dory and Marlin and has the giant like light attached to its head. Yeah, it scared Dory and it scared Marlin and you know what, it scared all of us too once we learned that it was actually real. The anglerfish is a deep water fish that is also bioluminescent, meaning it can create its own light and glow in the dark. The females are the ones that have a glowing bulb of flesh attached to their head and they use this to lure in all kinds of prey. Most anglerfish are about a foot in size but some can reach up to sizes of 3.3 feet. These terrifying fish have an enormous mouth filled with crazy sharp teeth that are all angled inward. Ouch. As if you weren't scared enough of these fish already, anglerfish can eat prey twice their size. I mean, humans are pretty much twice their size, so does that mean... Never mind, let's not go there. Rachel, over to you. Number nine, the green anaconda. Okay, look, if I'm being honest here, I could also put Burmese python on here too, because bottom line, they can and have swallowed a human being whole. Anything that is capable of doing that is nightmare fuel and I don't, I don't need that, I don't need that kind of energy. The green anaconda is the largest snake in the world capable of reaching lengths over 30 feet long and 12 inches around. They are so astounding that they have even been depicted as magical beings in South American mythology. Some local legends have even said that they can reach over 60 feet. <laughs> but there has yet to be a confirmed sighting. But if there is one somehow hiding out there, it's basically the closest thing to a basilisk, and I ain't going to slither in close to one of those anytime soon. At number eight, we have the Goliath tigerfish. This thing looks straight out of a horror movie, my god. This five foot large carnivorous fish lives in the Congo River in Africa. In the second episode of the hit TV series called River Monsters, host Jeremy Wade catches a giant demon fish, otherwise known as the Goliath tigerfish. Goliath because it's freaking huge, and tigerfish, well, because <laughs> look at those teeth. Some of these massive fish can even reach sizes of up to six feet and can weigh up to 150 pounds or more. I know I said these fish are carnivorous, but they're actually piscivores, meaning that they only eat fish, such as the small Nile perch. Kind of like people who are only pescatarians and only eat fish. That being said, these things will eat whatever is available to them. There was once an attack where a little girl down in the Congo went waist deep in the water and wore a little waist belt made out of bottle caps to fend off evil spirits, but unfortunately this belt couldn't fend off evil fish. The shine attracted a large goliath tiger fish and it made an attack on the girl. As far as I know, the young girl survived and she is okay, but this was the story that made Jeremy Wade want to visit the Congo. Yeah, <laughs> um, Jerem, I think you're alone on this one. Number seven, the Asian giant hornet. After hearing about this giant flying disappointment, you won't think the wasps we have are that bad at all. After all, they are called giant hornets for a reason, as they are the world's largest known hornet species ever. They can grow up to 1.5 to 2 inches, but their wingspan can span up to 3 inches. Thankfully, they are native to China, Japan, and several other Asian countries and have not been confirmed as established in North America, though they have been spotted. We especially dislike them on this channel due to the fact that they like to attack bee nests and destroy colonies. They are incredibly territorial and have been known to kill as many as 50. 50 people a year in Japan, hence earning the name Murder Hornets. Need I say more? At number six, we have the Emperor Scorpion, or its Latin name, Pandunus Imperator. I don't know if I said that right. Sounds cool, but I'ma just call it a big freaking scorpion. These scorpions are predominantly found in the African rainforests. They may not be as big as our other animals on our list, but let me tell you, they are still big enough to scare the hell out of me. These scorpions can reach almost up to eight inches in length. And just in case large black claws aren't enough to scare you away, these freaky things can even glow blue or green underneath ultraviolet rays. They also have a stinger that can produce venom, but it is not considered dangerous towards humans. Yeah, right, look at this thing. You're telling me it has those scary upgrades and it's not dangerous? towards humans? Yeah, okay, yeah, right. Next thing you're gonna tell me that dragons are real. Hmm? Number five, the Komodo dragon. Dragons sound incredibly cool, but in reality, they would be absolutely terrifying. Terrifying yet beautiful, these slow stalking creatures only need to get one bite in. Their serrated teeth latches onto prey and then tears away, leaving a gaping bloody wound that will never clot, because that's the job of their venom. As the venom seeps in, their prey will descend into shock and potentially bleed out as they escape. 
not potentially, they will bleed out as they escape. But this 10 foot long beast will slowly stalk behind and await the moment the poison takes hold. At number 4 we have the tarantula hawk. Ok, but get this, this creature is not a tarantula nor is it a hawk. So how could it get this crazy name and what the hell is it? The tarantula hawk is actually a big wasp that eats nectar, flowers and oh and one more thing, tarantulas. Meaning it gets the hawk part of its name from coming down and feasting on its prey just like a hawk. These wasps are found in every continent except Europe and Africa and grow up to 2 inches in length. And yet they still can prey on tarantulas which are a lot bigger than that. Once they have one of those creepy big furry spiders they feed them to its larvae. Ugh. They have blue bodies and these large orange wings and a good number of these wasps can be found in and around the Grand Canyon. So these wasps won't sting unless threatened but when they do it is apparently one of the most painful stings of any insect in the world. So in case you were wondering, no Dewey has no plans on ever visiting the Grand Canyon now. Number 3 The Goliath Spider. Look, it's not bigger than me. But the only good thing about this spider is that you don't have to worry about walking into like a massive web. Thankfully, they don't make them because they don't need to. Also referred to as the bird eating spider, these arachnids are ferocious when it comes to hunting. But funny enough, despite their name, they mainly gorge themselves on frogs and rodents. But how they do it? Ugh. They devour their prey by injecting them with a paralyzing venom and since they have no teeth besides like their two one inch long fangs, they regurgitate gastric acids to help consume them from the inside out. So all that's left of the animal is like the skin and bones. Thankfully, their poison isn't deadly to us, but their razor sharp fangs can still do some damage. They can actually puncture our skin. Oh, <laughs> and I forgot, they can grow up to a foot wide. Try smashing that with your boot. At number 2 we have the giant marine isopod. These things are freaking scary as hell but at the same time remind me of that Pokemon Kabuto. Anyone else see it? Anyway these massive wood lice like creatures can be found at the bottom of the sea floor. They can survive at depths of 500 meters and can reach sizes of up to 30 centimeters from head to tail. They were first discovered in 1879 by French zoologist Alphonse Milne Edwards in the Gulf of Mexico. They eat pretty much whatever falls to the bottom of the sea floor and since many things don't survive at those depths, it doesn't really have any predators. Apparently they are not as harmful as they look, but not much is known about these creatures just yet. Although their metabolism is very slow, apparently a giant isopod was kept in captivity in Japan and survived 5 years without eating. A couple of reasons for its size is that a deep sea creatures need to carry more oxygen as well as don't have many other predators which leads to them flourishing and growing in size. In the end even though these guys are quite harmless, I think that's all I need to know about them for now because I'm happy to have them stay on the sea floor where they are far 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 away. Away from me. Number one, remember that uh, scary bird I mentioned before? Yeah, the cassowary. For those of you who aren't Canadian, you may not understand the fear Canadians have of Canadian geese. They are territorial, vicious, and they poop everywhere. But I would take hissing cobra chickens over cassowaries any day. They can grow to heights over 6.6 .6 feet and weigh just over 190 pounds. But it's claws we are really afraid of. Their claws can and have gutted human beings with one slice and their pets. When you walk, they follow. If you run, they run after you. Though they are usually pretty shy, but if you get on their bad side or meet one that just knows it can take you, good day, mate. They also look equal parts beautiful and insane. Like the Harley Quinn of the emu family but not nearly as charming. They also make this sound. That's a nope. That's a nope. They are recognized by their ostrich like shape. I said emu earlier, I actually meant ostrich. They live in Australia so if you needed to know about one more thing on that constant that could kill you man, now you know. And that was our list of 10 largest animals that we really wish weren't real but they are. So lucky us. They are and you know what we're just gonna have to deal with it. Although I will say some of them aren't as big as what I thought they were supposed to be but that being said they are still freaking scary as hell. Well like they're still big like regular spider. Goliath spider. Yeah. That's huge. That's still too big for me. <laughs> too big for me. Uh <laughs> Starting us off at number 10 is the pygmy rabbit. Believe it or not, this is the smallest rabbit in the world. Their average body length is 9.4 to 11.4 inches, which is 24 to 29 centimeters, and adults only weigh up to 14 ounces, or 400 grams. The pygmy rabbit is a slate gray with a pinkish tinge in the winter and then turns more brown again in the summertime. 
In other words, even these little bunny rabbits can get better tans than I can. I'm not jealous, but you know, anyway, these cute and tiny rabbits can be found all over North America. Usually in areas with deep soil where they burrow into tall, dense sagebrush for cover and for food. In and amongst these dense sagebrush, these rabbits can travel through self-made escape routes from other predators. And if they didn't already seem like hard workers, they are also the only rabbits in the United States who dig their own burrows as well. Sadly, this cute little animal back in 2003 was listed as a threatened species due to the loss of habitat. It has since been listed as an endangered species. So if you happen to live in an area with sagebrush, leave it alone and help these little guys out. Just so you know, that's a common theme with today's video. A lot of them are very endangered. Number nine, the pink fairy armadillo. I want one. I want one so bad. I think I found a pet that was made for me. This little sweet angel baby is one of the cutest things on the planet. It looks like a sleepy guinea pig with an armored shell on top. So like an armored guinea pig. <laughs> they are the smallest kind of armadillo on the planet and also have a dorsal shell that's almost entirely separate from their body. The pink fairy has also been nicknamed sand swimmers as they can burrow and move through the ground with their incredible paws like they're swimming through the ocean like it's that easy for them. During the day they can dig and dig and dig and only come out at night to feed. Though you can usually find them near ant hills because that's easy fast food for them. On a particularly rainy day you may also see them emerge in order to prevent drowning and getting wet. If they get wet they can't thermoregulate properly which can make them ill. But sadly the pink fairy armadillo is on the endangered species list due to threats of their habitat and domestic dogs. At number 8 we have the arboreal minute salamander. If you look carefully at the forest floors of Oaxaca, Mexico, you just might catch a glimpse of one of these tiny lizard-like creatures. It will be fairly easy to spot thanks to its big bug-like eyes. The bodies of these salamanders average 17 millimeters in length, one millimeter shorter than the Jaraguá dwarf gecko, who didn't make our list today but gets an honorable shout out. The arboreal minute salamander beat out the dwarf gecko and is believed to be the world's smallest reptile. This is crazy because I thought salamanders were tiny enough already, but I guess not. And I'll never forget seeing my very first salamander underneath a log back in my grade 6 teacher's maple bush. Number 7, Madame Bertha's Mouse Lemur. Up next we have the smallest primate in the world. Reaching lengths of only 4.6 inches in adult males and 5 inches in females, these little fur babies are unfortunately on the critically endangered species list. The Madame Bertha's Mouse Lemur is native to Madagascar and is under threat due to habitat loss. It's easy to see why they are considered mouse lemurs due to their size and the fact that their tails are longer than their bodies. So they look like little mice. They are nocturnal and sleep for most of the day in tree nests and hollows which is why the species are under such threat. Due to slash and burn agriculture, many of their homes are cut down and burned away while they are still inside them, which is even sadder. Researchers estimate that if this process isn't halted immediately, then within 10 years, the species may no longer exist at all. So let's look for other avenues, shall we? At number six, we have my most favorite animal on this list, the speckled padloper tortoise. Why is it my favorite? Because one of my biggest fandoms other than Ghostbusters is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, if you didn't already know. So obviously turtles are one of my favorite animals of all time. The speckled padloper tortoise is definitely part of that. They are also the smallest turtle in the world with males measuring 2.4 to 3.1 inches or 6 to 8 centimeters in length and the females measuring up to 4 inches which is 10 centimeters in length. Sadly, these tiny turtles don't feed on tiny slices of pizza to my disappointment. They feed on small plants. They live in the rocky outcrops of South Africa where they can hide from their predators and live up to 90 to 100 years. Probably a bit safer than the sewers of New York City so I can't really blame them. Number 5 the bee hummingbird. This little bird is perfect for our channel and I think you can guess why because it's a, it's a bumblebee hummingbird. It's called the bee hummingbird for a reason as it's the world's smallest bird. They are so small they are often mistaken for bees. It measures a mere two and a quarter inches long and lives in the balmy climate of Cuba. They weigh less than two grams which is about the same feeling you'd get if you put a dime in the palm of your hand. It would weigh about the same. Small birds of course lay even smaller eggs and each one is about the size of a tiny coffee bean. But like their larger counterparts they fly incredibly incredibly fast with wings that can beat anywhere from 80 to 200 times a second depending on if it's mating season. If it's mating season they beat around 200 times a second. A second! That's over a thousand beats per minute. They also have two kinds of males, breeding and non-breeding. The breeding males are bright and colorful while females and non-breeding males feature more grayscale colors. But the males can get quite aggressive and have been known to chase our channel mascot out of its territory when it comes to seeking out nectar. So. 
Looks like we got some competition. <laughs> At number four, staying with the bumblebee theme, we have the bumblebee bat, or more commonly known as the kiddest hognose bat. This tiny bat is not only the world's smallest bat, but also the world's smallest living mammal. These bats get their name due to their pig-like snouts and reddish brown coats of fur. They measure in at 1.1 to 1.6 inches and weigh only 0.05 to 0.07 ounces. That's only 1.5 to 2 grams. In case you're wondering why it's also called the bumblebee bat, it's because it is the exact same size as our mascot, a bumblebee. How fitting for it to pop up on our channel, huh? These tiny bats live in the limestone caves along the rivers of Thailand and Burma. An average of 100 individual bats can live in a single cave, and they are sadly also an endangered species. So once again, go online and see what you can do to help these little creatures. Maybe even start a group and meet every week dressing up as Batman characters who swear to save these tiny little guys. Never mind, I called this on that idea, but you are all welcome to join me. Number three, the Barbados Thread Snakes. These little boop snoops are considered the smallest snakes in the world. If you didn't know any better, you would think they were some kind of worm at first glance. They are so small that they can fit comfortably on a quarter. If you weren't able to guess by the title, these living spaghetti noodles are usually found in tropical climates, specifically Barbados, and they were actually discovered pretty recently. It was first identified as a separate species in 2008, and their size makes it no wonder why we haven't met them before. He literally just found one under a rock and was like, huh, that looks new. They they are passionate nocturnal burrowers and don't often come out unless they need to feed. Their diet mainly consists of ants and termites, and I think this is really cool. The pheromones they excrete prevents them from being eaten by termites themselves. Cool, right? Thread snakes are also only able to produce one egg at a time, as they just aren't big enough for more than one. The eggs are already minuscule, and if they were any smaller, the species wouldn't be able to survive. Like many on this list, they are also on the critically endangered list due to habitat loss. At our number two spot, we have the Pedophrine onomensis, or the much easier name to call them, the world's smallest frog. Thank you for that one. They also take the smallest vertebrate and smallest amphibian title on Earth. This tiny frog was first discovered in New Guinea back in 2009. It's a new species that doesn't even have a proper name yet, which is why they have such the difficult name that I probably couldn't say earlier. Its average body size is 0.3 inches, or 7.7 .7 millimeters in length, and they are smaller than a dime. It's no wonder that these guys were only discovered in 2009, because not only are they so tiny that anyone can barely see them, they also camouflage in with the leaf litter of tropical forests. So if any of you guys find yourselves in tropical forests of New Guinea, maybe take a magnifying glass and watch your step for these tiny frogs. And last but not least, the Brucheesia micra chameleon. And here we are in our number one spot is a chameleon who is barely the size of the tip of a match. A creature so small, we only discovered them back in 2012. It is so small, it can sit comfortably on the tip of your pinky. These little cold-blooded lizards only grow to about 29 millimeters. That's smaller than some insects. It can be found on Madagascar. Love Madagascar, I feel like that's where all the strangest animals are. Which is coincidentally one of the places the largest lizard is found. But unlike their larger counterpart, Brachysia chameleons can use their tail to climb, while other chameleons cannot. Albeit they can't climb very high, only about 4 inches off the ground. But that probably seems like a 10 story building to these little guys. Success is relative after all. But that being said, despite their efforts, they are relatively easy to catch if you find them, though you might not be able to for long. This tiny little species is endangered due to significant habitat loss, though it probably doesn't help that if you see one you can literally just pick it up and there's no fight in that at all. So. And there you have it, that has been our top 10 smallest animals in the world. You won't believe, so do you? Do you believe us? Do you Are believe? we lying? Are you a believer? Number 10, mysterious kayak attack. The lassophobia is the fear of the ocean, but it's not just that. It's the fear that creeps up when you can't see the bottom of a river or a lake and don't know what's lurking beneath. Considering only 5% of the Earth's ocean has been explored, I feel like this is a pretty valid fear in a lot of ways, amplified by this video. Check it out. Okay, so we don't actually get to see it, but I think that's what makes this video so terrifying. You can only assume that it was a shark, but we don't know for sure. And I can't even comprehend how terrifying it would be not being able to see how big or where this creature was, especially considering the ferocity with which whatever it was tried to attack him. This could have been one deadly encounter. Number nine, saving a nurse shark.
The craziest part about this video for me is the irony of this encounter. Had these humans not shown up, this shark probably would have died without being able to get food or protect itself because it was literally trapped. But had humans not become little trash mongrels, then the shark wouldn't have been trapped in this way in the first place. So it's just like a weird, crazy circular cycle that I think this video highlights really, really well. And I, I hope those guys keep doing what they're doing, saving the ocean one piece of plastic at a time. Number eight, otter on the run. This next one is so surreal. I'll let the video speak for itself. Come on up, bud. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Not only did these people get up close and personal to an otter, which definitely is on my list because they're so cute. They hold hands so they don't separate from each other. How adorable is that? Immediately after they got to see a massive orca swim close to their boat. In this one instance, humanity and nature walked hand in hand as this otter fought for its life. But then this guy just can't move because otherwise this poor otter will meet a bloody fate. Does the boatman just let this poor guy succumb to survival of the fittest? Thankfully he doesn't. The video kind of ends on a definite cliffhanger, but rest assured the vessel's owner, John Dornella, eventually drove the boat to a safe distance. And then eventually the otter decided to jump ship. Pretty cool. But it turns out that the otter wasn't just fleeing from any orca, oh no no. John discovered the orca's ID number and found out it was the largest in its pod. This guy did this otter a huge solid, that is for sure. Number seven, nurse shark. So fun fact, I actually swam with nurse sharks a while ago, one year on vacation, and it wasn't as dangerous as swimming with sharks sounds because nurse sharks are actually pretty docile. They just kind of chilled out at the bottom of the sand pit and the actual, the guides had to go down and like rustle them up. And they were like, no, leave me alone. I was sleeping, bro. Very, very chill experience. There were also giant manta rays, which was kind of the thing I was the most afraid of because of the whole Steve Irwin fiasco. But still, nurse sharks kind of live up to their name, but still, put some food in your hand and you might see a whole other side. Thankfully, the woman in this video is okay, but it does just go to show. Maybe don't feed the sharks, even if their name sounds disarming. Number six, whale to the rescue. It would be surreal to even see a whale that close, but to have one save your life? There are no words, check this out. This is such a mystery to me. This is this is real life flipper, except instead of Elijah Wood and a dolphin, it's a whale. Like a whale went, oh, that thing, whatever it is, it's in danger and I'm gonna let it know. The like the innate kindness this animal was capable of. I just don't even know how to wrap my mind around this. It's not like, I haven't even met humans that kind. That's not true, people are pretty great. It's not like we have an IQ test we can make for animals to take, but we know they have very strong instincts and we know that they've shown signs of emotional intelligence. So I don't know guys, whales might have just become my favorite animal. I just think it's kind of surreal. I mean, we know that um, the size of a brain doesn't necessarily correlate with like intelligence, but in terms of the ratio of brain size to body mass, it can, so who? knows but either way this video is so surreal and i can't even believe it exists number five baby beluga speaking of whales beluga whales were the reason i wanted to go to places like marine land so bad when i was younger you know before i realized that they actually weren't that great they look like the perfect mix between a dolphin and a whale and they just look like they're always having a good time they look smiling and curious and i just love them this video is no exception this man just kayaking living his best life with a beautiful perfect and curious little beluga whale just comes up to visit and he even gets to pet him Ah, my dreams realize. See, we don't even need places like Marine Land to experience this kind of natural wonder. Though it looks like this little guy was camera shy because it just took his GoPro and then gave it back. Like, again, mind blowing because somehow this blue whale knew, oh, wait a minute, 
this guy, he wants this back. I'm gonna go get it. Like, I just, I can't even, this is insane. What do you guys think of that? Wow. Number four, close encounter of the whale kind. I held my breath when I first saw this clip. A warning to anyone going scuba diving in an ocean. If you see a flurry of fish just bolting it to the surface, get out of the way. These divers came so close to getting too close to the inside of a whale. Something that will come up later. In hint. Stunning and terrifying. What a great mix. When not one but two massive whales breached the surface, those guys got so far out of there. They were like, wow, this is great. Whoa. And then they just fled to the boat. I would too, for sure. Ugh. Creepy, creepy, creepy. But beautiful at the same time. Like, I don't even know what that would be like to experience. Uh, anyways, guys, before we get to our top three, remember to hit that like button and subscribe to stay a part of our hive. Uh, we appreciate all the help that we can get. And we appreciate any and all love you show us. So thank you so much. Number three, an octopus lending a hand. Can we call this story a love story? Ah. Uh I'm not sure. I feel like that's treading dangerous waters. As I mentioned earlier, we know humans have barely, barely scratched the surface when it comes to exploring the ocean, but that means that a lot of creatures still haven't met us. I mean, chances are, sadly, they've met our garbage before they've seen us. But this interaction between two curious beings just goes to show we aren't the only ones asking questions. Number two, deflate before it's too late. This next clip is my worst nightmare. I also think this is the first time I've ever mentioned Flipper twice in one day. Well, at least in the last five years. I can't remember the last time I saw that movie. But there is that scene where he's just floating in a raft and it gets attacked by a massive shark and just starts deflating. Once you watch this clip, you can understand why it immediately made me flash back to that moment. I mean, what are they gonna do? They are literally minutes from being shark meat. This is not how I would like to encounter such a magnificent creature. I would prefer not at all, or at least safely behind my TV screen during Shark Week, because love me some Shark Week, but wow. They're standing there filming. Dudes, call for help. You got a phone. And number one, a man inside a whale. Of course this is number one. Remember how I said we were gonna come to this later? Well, here it is. Michael Picard, a lobster fisherman in Massachusetts, almost met death inside the mouth of a whale. This is the closest real life experience to that scene in Pinocchio we all have nightmares about, you know, when they're like, fighting the whale and they end up inside it. Terrifying. Spoilers if you've never seen the movie, but also, why haven't you seen the movie? Michael was diving for lobster when he suddenly heard a loud bang and then everything went dark. He said it felt like getting hit by a freight truck, which I mean, isn't really far off. He thought, and I quote, what the heck, did I just get eaten by a shark? But no, a shark's mouth is not that big and I don't feel any teeth, unquote. Next thing he knew, he was flying through the water at an incredibly high speed, thinking he was going to die. Of course, how terrifying would that be? But after 30 to 40 seconds of him banging on the whale's mouth, he finally spat him out. So to be clear, he wasn't swallowed by the whale, but he was just hanging out in his mouth, Dorian Marlin style. But still, like how crazy is that? Not many people get to say that they were eaten by a whale and live to tell the tale. Number 10, hairless squirrels. I can't decide. I can't decide whether these are cute or terrifying. I guess it all depends on how you feel about squirrels. I think they're cute personally. One time a squirrel kissed my hand with its nose and I, now I just can't unsee them. I think they're perfect. But if you do see a hairless squirrel, the reason it is hairless is probably due to a case of sarcoptic mange, which is a result of burrowing mites. Sounds awful. It is contagious but treatable, so make sure not to get your pet too close. And if they are asking for help, call a wildlife center to see what they have to say. 
USA. Number nine, hairless cattle. Hairless cows have been found among herds as far back as 1898. The condition is called hypotrichosis caused by a recessive gene. It can be expressed in either complete or partial loss of hair and can leave cows prone to death due to environmental conditions, AKA they get cold. They don't look that shocking from far off because cows tend to have pretty short hair to begin with. But if you really want to find one, just look for the guy rocking an awesome cow sweater or I don't know, a cape. How cool would that be? Super cow. That sounds like the perfect cow for Lindsay Ivan. Number eight, hairless guinea pigs. Also known as a skinny pig, these guys kind of look like the house hippo we've always wanted. Just get one of these, it's our dream at long last realize, at least for anybody up in Canada. The house hippo commercials were epic. We all wanted them to be real. A skinny pig is a guinea pig with a hairless mutation, though they do have a bit of fuzz by their muzzle, feet, and legs. The reason the mutation started though was a result of animal testing. They were bred specifically for dermatology studies, but now some of them have loving homes, which is super great. Despite the name, they're not actually skinnier than guinea pigs. They're, they're still chonky. That's why they look like a house hippo. Number seven, hairless raccoon. Way back in the summer of 2009, a strange creature roamed the backyards and dumpsters of Parkdale, Toronto. Some called it the Toronto Terror, while others assumed it was a plus size possum or a strange undiscovered species. But what was it actually? A hairless raccoon? Susan McDonald, a biologist from York University, confirmed the identity saying that it was quite clearly a hairless raccoon. Additionally, a few residents of Parkdale filled in some of the mystery. Baldy, which became her new nickname, name, had been a local resident for years and some had witnessed her steady decline from fuzzy to barely there. Either through some form of mange or alopecia, Baldi slowly started to lose all of her fur. But despite that, she does appear to be at a good weight and looks well hydrated, so it looks like Baldi is living her best life, living all the way out in the open. Cute or strange, what do you guys think? Number six, hairless baboon. By now we are aware of the two main causes as to why animals lose their hair, alopecia and mange, but this next one boggled researchers. 65 year old Ann Warner was exploring the countryside in her adopted home of Zimbabwe when they spotted something super strange. A hairless female baboon all alone. It's customary for baboons to travel in packs as they are very social animals, but sadly this little lady had been abandoned by her friends. She didn't appear to be suffering from any kind of mange or alopecia, so researchers wondered what had happened. One theory is that she was groomed clean by her mother, which is exactly what happened to a baby baboon at a zoo in Devon. PETA took that as a sign that the mother was stressed out, so they ordered the zoo to stop breeding baboons. That makes sense. It's been eight years since she was discovered, and I hope within that time that she found a family who would love her hairless and all. Number five, spikeless hedgehog. We've talked about hairless, but what about spikeless? You didn't know that out there in the world there is an animal that has been rendered absolutely useless. Besides being cute AF, meet Nelson. This little guy, this little guy has to be massaged with lotion every day because he doesn't have the one thing meant to protect him, so he's very dry. He currently lives at the Foxy Lodge Wildlife Rescue in Hemsby, but it's basically a spa because he gets massaged every day. I wanna feel a bit sorry for him, but it looks like he's living the best life, so go Nelson. Number four, hairless bear. Everyone meet Eve. Eve had a tough time, and when she was finally discovered dumpster diving, it was definitely a shock to passersby. I'm not even sure what I would have thought she was. Is that a human bear baby? A, a were bear? But no, it was just Eve having a hard time recovering from mange. When Eve was found, she weighed just 30 pounds, was visibly ill, and entirely bald. Fortunately, the Fun for Animals Wildlife Center in Ramona, California came to her rescue. Here, Eve underwent nearly two years of rehab to treat her neglect, medical issues, and mange, and by 2019, she had some of that hair growing back. But if you ever wanted to know what a hairless bear looked like, that's what that's what, that's what what that looks like. It's kind of terrifying, but cute. Hopefully, hopefully by now, she is no longer the Berenstein Bear Bear she was when she was found. Number three, hairless horse. Have you ever seen a festival? Well, you're about to. Hairless horses exist, and if you haven't seen Harry Potter and you don't know what a festival is, get out from underneath the rock you've been hiding under for like the last 15 years, geez. Well, this is pretty much what they look like, except without the wings and the dark decaying skin. It most commonly occurs in the Akal Teke breed of horse from Turkmenistan. Fowls are born with what is now called naked fowl syndrome, where they are born with practically no hair and scaly skin. Sadly, they don't live very long, the longest being from a few weeks to 
to three years. Though researchers can't yet be sure as to whether the condition is directly related to their passing, the first record of the hairless gene dates back to 1938 and keeps increasing. No one knows what is causing it, so it remains a mystery, but in case you ever wanted to know what a hairless horse looks like, there it is. You are welcome. And before we finish today's list, make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new or like, comment, whatever you want to do. It really helps us out and we love you for it. Number two, hairless rabbit. I think out of all the ones on this list, this one made me die a bit. I understand bunnies should be fluffy, but why is that so cute? It looks so delicate and soft and I just want to hold it safe in my hand and make sure they know that they're loved. I'm just mm. Bumblebee fam, meet Mr. Bigglesworth, so named for its resemblance to the cat in Austin Powell. Cassandra Hall from Victoria, Australia saw this little buddy listed on a breeder website and immediately was like, that's mine. According to the breeder, hairless rabbits do sometimes occur and don't sell. He even had to put one down before, but luckily Cassandra saved good old Biggles and even made him little sweaters to keep him warm. I, I can't, it's so cute. It's perfect. And last but not least, hairless parrots. This is Rhea, a featherless parrot. I know the list says hair, but I think we can get over it. And yes, I know, I see it too. Rhea looks like a chicken before you cook it, but don't you dare. Rhea is much beloved by owner Isabella Eisman and suffers from PBFD, a disease that attacks the follicles in her skin and prevents feathers from growing back. Just two years after this little girl was born, she had lost every single feather. But don't worry, it doesn't mean she doesn't have style. Rhea has rocked her own line of sweaters and capes to keep herself warm. Currently, there is no cure for PBFD, but boy does she make RuPaul proud because she wears it well. Mmm, love it. Go Rhea. Go Rhea. Go Rhea. And that was our top 10 list of animals without hair you won't believe. Do you believe it? Special shout out to Rufus the Naked Mole Rat and Hairless Cats and Dogs. I lived with a hairless cat named Spock for about six months and I learned a lot. One of the cutest times of my life. I did find out that they sweat a lot though, which was kind of weird. Like you couldn't wear white, otherwise they would just like leave a mark. Very weird. Starting us off at our number 10 spot, we have Hydras. No, not the evil villains from the Marvel Universe. I'm talking about these small water-based creatures found in the fresh waters of Europe, Asia, and the Americas. There are between 20 to 30 different species of Hydra, and they are one of the 900 species belonging to the phylum Cyndaria, which are radially symmetrical invertebrates with tentacles. But the really cool part about these underwater creatures is that they are basically immortal. Studies show that these creatures do not show any signs of deterioration with age. They are able to continuously divide and regenerate new body cells and can basically keep themselves young forever. Remember that song Forever Young by Alphaville? It actually might be just about hydras, I think. Number nine, clams. Unless their lives are cut short by the yearly clam bake with your aunts and uncles, clams can actually live an absurdly long time for being that small. Some have even been found to be over a century old. Now to be fair, humans are starting to stretch that boundary too. We're trying our best. But considering how often clams are our food source, it's surprising. Like trees, clamshells also have rings on them, if you look carefully, that track how long they've been alive, which is how scientists can tell how long they've lived. Therefore, the bigger they are, the longer they've lived. They can weigh up to several hundred pounds and be as large as a yard across. The oldest clam ever found was named Ming Ming, and though she was only the size of an average human palm, she was about 507 years old, which is like, what? Does size matter? At our number eight spot, we have the rough eye rockfish. Pretty crazy name, right? Well, they get the name because of the spines that go along the bottom of their eyes. Kind of a rude name when you think about it. But these bright and intensely colored fish can be found in the Pacific Ocean, ranging from the northern part of Japan and Bering Sea, all the way to the North American coast down to California. Odds are, you won't get a chance to see any of these creatures unless you do a deep, deep dive because they live and spend most of their time at around 170 to 660 meters below the ocean surface. That's 560 to 2200 feet deep. These fish have been known to live over the age of 205 years old and mature much later on in their life. So that means they get to live most of their life looking young, fresh, happy, full of life with all their hopes and dreams ahead of them. <laughs> uh, must be nice. I mean, honestly, I can kind of do that too. If I ever do a video with my beard shaved off, you will see a Dewey that looks like he is 12. <laughs> Number seven, the Aldebaran giant tortoise. The oldest Aldebaran giant tortoise known to man passed away in 2007, and she was 255 years old, superseding her first owner, Robert Clive, who died at the age of 49 in 1774. 
Robert Clive was the first British governor in the Bengal presidency and was given Adwaita as a pet. It is not uncommon for Aldebar tortoises to live through centuries, and some even suggest that there have been ones twice as old as Adwaita who have existed. They only reach maturity at 30 years old, so they age as slowly as they move, it seems. They also can go long periods without food and aren't picky eaters. They can eat almost anything from vegetation to dead carcasses to even feces. Ugh. With their ability to thrive on both land and water, on top of having a very hard shell to protect them from predators, this species is the poster child for the phrase, slow and steady wins the race. At our number six spot, we have the tree weta, also known as zombie bugs, or also also known as Dewey's worst nightmare. These bugs are ridiculously resilient to freezing and have special proteins within their bodies that prevent freezing from ever actually occurring. Although their hearts and brains are not as resilient to freezing, they can die when being completely frozen. But guess what? When they thaw out, they can come completely back to life like the disgusting zombie-like creatures they are and scare Dewey back into his protective bunker away from every single scary bug on the planet. I've mentioned it before, Dewey doesn't do bugs. But you know what Dewey really doesn't do? Zombie bugs! Number five, glass sponges, not glass slippers. Don't let the name fool you, these sponges are anything but fragile. Forget centuries, these creatures can live for thousands of years, even in the 10,000s. But for a while they were thought to have gone extinct. Joke's on us, goes to show how much we know about the ocean, which by the way isn't a lot, it's like less than 30%. In 1987, a team of Canadian scientists discovered a cluster of living glass sponge reefs over 9,000 years old. So if they can live and thrive for so long, why are they called glass? Well, they get their name from their spicules, which are tiny sharp structures made from silica, a kind of glass. They feed off of plankton and other small sources of food and can filter enough water in 60 seconds, get ready, to fill an Olympic sized pool. They also don't look appetizing and mostly serve as homes to other kinds of fish and crustaceans. Though starfish tend to like to feed on them now and then, it's pretty sad. Coming in at our number four spot is one of my favorite things to eat, lobster. Or as a much more fun name, the Homerus Americanus. Sounds like gladiator. I am Homerus Americanus, are you not entertained? Scientists have discovered that through time, some lobsters can increase their fertility due to a certain enzyme called telomerase. This enzyme repairs the lost sections of DNA, making the aged cells revert back to being young again. Though this would seem to make these creatures immortal, the exact lifespan of these creatures is difficult to determine because of the regular molting of exoskeletons. Aside from that, they only have one major predator to fear, and that is me. If you like this video and you are new to our hive, make sure to like and subscribe. We love you for it, and uh, one day, hopefully, we'll all be able to hug you. I don't know. I hope so. Number three, bowhead whales. There must be something about the cold climate of the Arctic because it seems like some of the biggest creatures live there, including the bowhead whale, who by the way, is not only massive, but can live for over two centuries. They are one of the most well-adapted creatures who live in the Arctic with an insulating layer of lubber over a foot and a half thick without humans being the hunters. Given that they are some of the biggest creatures, nothing can really threaten their existence. But beyond that, the reason they can live for so long is due to their unique genetic makeup that allows them to repair their own damaged DNA. They also age slower in general, similar to the tortoise we talked about, and they only reach sexual maturity around 25 to 30 years old. So even though time takes its sweet time killing them, humans don't, and they are under the endangered species list. Coming in at our number two spot is the Greenland shark. Known as the longest living vertebrate on Earth, this shark lives an average of 272 years old. They also don't reach sexual maturity until the age of 150 years old. Now, how can they live so long? Well, with their incredible resilience to cold water, darkness, and living at depths of 2200 meters, I'm guessing most of these sharks won't have much competition down there. This shark is actually from the prehistoric era, which is proven by an extra gill that it has on its body. So not only do these things live for crazy long periods of time, they were able to come out on top after the destruction of the dinosaurs. Man, these guys ain't playing. Number one, Teratopsis dorni. Imagine being able to decide like when you feel like getting younger, you know? <laughs> Too old, I'm gonna go back a few years, wow. When will we have that technology? Sounds impossible, but this specific kind of jellyfish can actually do this. When it reaches a certain age, it can begin converting its cells backwards in time. 
Mm. They aren't indestructible, they can still be gobbled up, but depending on how lucky they are, they could potentially live forever. The creature was first discovered in 1883 and has captured the curiosity of scientists ever since. After all, why wouldn't it? An animal that has figured out how to turn back the clock of time? Now that sounds super useful. These creatures are able to do this through a process called transdifferentiation. The cells begin to convert from one type to another, albeit very slowly. They aren't really aware they are doing it, since jellyfish don't really have brains. They simply survive by how their nerves respond to stimuli, kind of like when a doctor hits your knee with a hammer and you just kick something, it's involuntary. They have no idea how rare and how incredible they really are. Honorable mentions to tardigrades, the water bears, because they're really cute and weird, and they can also live forever. Thank you so much for joining us on Bumblebee as we reviewed our top 10 list of animals that can't die. Can't die, being that they probably got eaten up if they didn't live If they did long. die. But imagine how much of a boss you'd have to be to like live to 250 years and just not die. I mean, yeah, I don't, like, it's funny, because as much as I actually do want to live forever, there's part of me that goes, no, you have to get to a certain point where you're just like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> wait. Starting us off at number 10, and an animal I only wish I would have been alive to see is a human-sized penguin. Back in 2019, the remains of what can only be described as a giant penguin were discovered in New Zealand by paleontologists. The fossilized bones of the animal indicate that this giant penguin reached a height of approximately 5 foot 3 inches and weighed in around 176 pounds. That's about 80 kilograms. That's a big mother freaking penguin. These large creatures lived in the Paleocene Epoch around 56 to 66 million years ago. They were specific to the waters of the southern hemisphere and it is said that they grew to be this large after the disappearance of large marine reptiles along with the dinosaurs indicating that these penguins were able to survive and thrive, becoming much larger over time. The largest penguin on Earth today is the Emperor Penguin, measuring around 3.9 feet. If those penguins are called Emperor, then I think I'm gonna call these guys Mega Emperor Penguins. Number nine, Terror Birds. Pretty much sums it up, but I'll fill in the facts for you. The forest rakos were one of the largest birds to ever exist on the earth and they certainly lived up to their street name. Once T-Rexes were extinct, these massive and deadly creatures stole the crown. Their jaws were so strong, they could sever the spine of a large horse in one bite. They roam South America and though scientists have a spare few ideas as to how they actually behave, they are comparable to a velociraptor, except taller. Their height ranged from 3 to 10 feet tall, but also like the Velociraptor, they could not fly, which was fine with any prey that were able to get out of their reach. Their supremacy as emperor predators lasted for about 60 million years until they mysteriously faded out 2.5 million years ago. No one quite knows why as of yet. Could it have been the environment that became their biggest nemesis? I guess we'll never know. And number 8, we have the Pelagornis Sanzi. 30 million years ago, our cute little trips to the beach wouldn't have been so cute. We would not only have to put up with seagulls, we would have to put up with the much larger ancestor, the Pelagornis sanzi. Back in 1983, in South Carolina, the first fossil of this massive extinct bird was discovered when construction crews began the expansion of the Charleston International Airport. This bird had a wingspan of up to 24 feet. That's almost seven and a half meters. If the sheer size of this animal wasn't enough to scare you, you'll be happy to know that it had a mouth filled with suedo teeth making it easy to devour its prey. Based on bone structures, scientists are fairly certain that this bird did fly, although they are not sure. Once a bird reaches a certain size and weight, it becomes much more difficult for it to fly without needing extra energy and power. But scientists believe these birds could have also used their wings to glide as well as catch the ocean winds to keep themselves airborne. Seagulls are annoying enough. Imagine a giant one that could also eat you. I would be intimidated, but if they also did that dumb, stupid, like, seagull laugh, uh -huh. I don't think I'd be able to hold it together. Number seven, hell pigs. I know, it sounds like a biker gang. But once I tell you more about this creature, you'll understand the name. The Deodon is an extinct genus of massive killer pig that existed 29 to 19 million years ago, occupying North America after the dinosaurs bit the dust. They weren't picky eaters, which meant they would eat anything and everything in their path, regardless of size. Imagine a pig standing six feet tall and 12 feet long, weighing 2,000 pounds with razor blades for teeth. Its head alone measured three feet and could take on even the most ferocious predators. Scientists aren't quite sure as to why they went extinct, but we are certainly glad they did. Otherwise, we might have been their prey, not the other way around. 
At our number six spot, we have the Goliath beetle. Now, this doesn't really make dinosaurs look small, but this is the closest thing that is still alive that resembles the size of insects back in the prehistoric times. Also, we couldn't let Dewey get away with just one video that didn't involve massive skin crawling bugs, right? The Goliath beetle is the heaviest insect currently on Earth, weighing in at around 100 grams or 3.5 ounces. They can grow to lengths of 11.5 centimeters. That's 4.5 inches. These beetles are native to tropical regions of Africa and feed on plant sap and fruit. These things move extremely slow and are fairly easy to catch if interested. I'm not. But please, just let them be and keep them far away from me. I watched a video on YouTube while researching and some guy let this thing crawl all the way up his arm. <laughs> are you crazy? Number five, the super croc. Imagine a creature that can make the crocodiles you've seen look like geckos. The Perosaurus was one of the largest crocodile relatives to ever exist. How big could it get? Well, about double the size of crocodiles today, so around 35 to 40 feet and weighed three tons on average. Yeah. The colossal creature terrorized the waters of South America around eight million years ago. An interesting fact about this guy though is that unlike a lot of its relatives, it was actually an omnivore, meaning that it didn't just feed on fish, but also vegetation. So the real moral of the story is that if you want to grow big and strong kids, remember to eat your vegetables. Coming in at our number four spot, we have the sperm whale. Hey, Rachel, you know what I can do? What? Speak whale. Oh, oh. The sperm whale is one of the largest mammals on Earth and actually also have the largest brains on Earth. These aquatic creatures can grow in sizes from 49 to 59 feet in length. That's just under 18 meters. And can weigh up to 35 to 45 tons. That's a big fish. The whales also have a substance known as spermaceti in their heads that scientists don't fully understand the purpose of yet. Some believe that it actually assists the whale with its buoyancy. You know, its uh, <laughs> floatiness. They are also quite the deep divers and can reach depths of 3,280 feet by holding their breath for up to 90 minutes. At those depths, they search for squid and other delicious seafood prey. And the bigger, the better, because it takes a lot to feed these things. They have been known to eat about one ton of food a day. <laughs> Me too, man. Me too. Number three is a name I could actually say. Colossal squid. It should be no surprise to you given its name that this creature has made it onto this list. I mean, its name alone depicts a massive creature. You don't get called colossal for nothing. Thankfully, this creature doesn't roam any beaches, but instead prefers the dark, cold recesses of the Antarctic waters. Weighing in at over one thousand pounds, the colossal squid can grow to an immense size of 46 feet, right? With eight tentacles and two arms, each equipped with sharp hooks designed to latch onto their prey. And they also kind of rotate on their suckers. Weird, right? So even if you try to get it out of it, it's like, uh, that's exactly what fish do down there, I guess. They can consume fish as large as seven feet and have even been known to attack sperm whales. Whoa, as some have been found with scarring matching the colossal squid. Okay, so I know that there have been dinosaurs bigger than this one, but it's still pretty massive and it's very real and they do exist and um, they're coming to get you. Coming in at our number two spot is quite possibly one of the scariest animals to have ever lived on planet Earth, the Megalodon shark. We're gonna need a bigger boat. These sharks lived during the early Miocene epoch to the end of the Pliocene epoch about 23 to 2.5 million years ago. The Megalodon made up of compound Greek root words translates to giant tooth when boy oh boy did these things have giant teeth. The Megalodon female could reach sizes up to 58.7 feet or approximately 18 meters and the males could reach sizes of up to 47 feet which is approximately 14 and a half meters. Female sharks could reach weights up to 143,000 pounds which is about 65,000 kilograms. These are the largest fish we have ever known. In case it wasn't obvious and you were wondering, yeah, these massive beasts had quite the nasty bite. Its bite diameter was about three meters. Needless to say, they were at the top of their food chain, which is probably why they lived for almost 20 million years. Sadly, the closest thing you can get to seeing a megalodon shark these days are the bones in museums or to watch the Meg, starring Jason Statham. Warning, the CGI is bad. Number one, the blue whale. And finally, in our last corner, ringing in at 200 tons, measuring 82 to 105 feet in size, we have the one, the only, the blue whale. 
Blue whales are the biggest animals ever known to exist on Earth, bigger than any dinosaurs we have currently uncovered. Its heart alone weighs 400 pounds, and its arteries could be big enough for a small child to swim through, and it only beats around twice a minute versus our 60 to 100 beats per minute, which is insane. Despite being carnivores, and unless you get caught in the way like that man in Massachusetts this year, they are also gentle giants. They mainly feed on krill, which seems like a pretty small fish to satisfy such a massive creature, though it may be one of the reasons they get so big. But you may hear them before you see them, as their kips and calls can be heard from a thousand miles away. Comparatively, a jet engine registers at 140 decibels, while a blue whale is closer to 188. Imagine being next to that when it just calls out to its friend. Nothing like Dory in Finding Nemo. Blue whales are currently on the endangered species list due to extensive whaling in the 1900s, collisions with ships, and garbage debris in the ocean. So hopefully, we fix that problem before we lose the most amazing creature on this planet.